All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, and welcome to the SSR Residence Education Club webinar. My name is Kenny Walker, and I will be serving as moderator for the session. Uh, I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Just want to remind everybody before we get started, uh, please do uh, log in or sign into poll everywhere. There's a link um, in the webinar chat. Uh, so please do make sure to log in so you can participate during uh, Dr. Endo's lecture. Now, speaking of Dr. Endo, uh, I would like to uh, introduce him. It's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Uh, he is uh, a musculoskeletal radiologist, um, associate professor at Weill Cornell um, and uh, attending radiologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery. He also serves as the director of ultrasound education at HSS. Um, and he's the winner of teacher of the year multiple years over. So you're in for some good learning this evening. Um, so welcome Dr. Yoshimi Endo. Thank you, uh, Kenny. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Yoshimi Endo again uh, from Hospital for Special Surgery. And um, I don't have any disclosures. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, the objectives of this talk are to uh, not talk about uh, not just musculoskeletal ultrasound, but specifically how a dynamic ultrasound uh, can be used for uh, in clinical practice and for problem solving purposes. And I'll be doing this in a case based approach. And I realized that. Um, you know, uh, there's going to be a wide variety of uh, amount of exposure to uh, ultrasound, musculoskeletal ultrasound amongst uh, the people in the audience. And not, um, I know that uh, not every, um, you know, radiology residency uh, exposes their residents to musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, but so, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, uh, this will be informative for everybody. And, um, you know, I'll be, uh, these cases will be pretty, pretty simple yet um, uh, insightful. So hopefully, hopefully you'll enjoy this. So when do we use um, dynamic uh, ultrasound uh, in musculoskeletal imaging? So I think um, ultrasound, uh, especially dynamic ultrasound, is very uh, help useful uh, in musculoskeletal uh, in patients who come in with musculoskeletal issues because you know not uncommonly patients present with uh, things that occur uh, with motion. You know. Um, uh, clicking or snapping sensation uh, they may present with, or uh, they may feel something moving in their joint or, or in, in, in the extremity, um, or they may hear something, they may hear a noise uh, when they're moving uh, their limb. No, so, um, and all of the, these structures uh, are, um, no, uh, all those entities uh, required the, the patient to be moving their body part in order to elicit their symptoms. So this is really um, best evaluated with ultrasound where you can um, you know, move the patient and move the body part in real time. And uh, this is not something that's possible in uh, other modalities where the patient has to be lying still like an MRI or a CT scan. Um, but in others, you no, know, there are other settings where dynamic ultrasound is also useful for, um, even if um, the patient doesn't feel anything snapping or any, uh, hear any any noise with motion. Um, you know, evaluating a lot of soft tissues such as tendons uh, and also uh, joint caps or ligaments. Um, you know, when you apply tension to those structures, it actually um, you know uh, helps in evaluating those structures. And also characteriz characterization of masses. You know, um, I think. Uh, you, you guys should know that um, ultrasound is very good for um, this differentiating cystic masses from solid masses. Uh, but um, if you apply dynamic maneuvers, such as compression of the mass, or if you try to move it uh, or apply tension to the mass, uh, that can also um, help in uh, further assessment of that mass. So these are, and just, just to uh, illustrate a point, these are uh, videos that were, were given to me by one of my uh, more senior colleagues, Dr. Ted Miller at HSS. Um, but uh, you, know, um, you guys should know that there are flexor, the, the, the flexor tendons on the volar aspect of the finger um, have, you know, you have a set of two tendons, FD, the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons. Um, at each finger, and they have a, a slightly different function. And sometimes, um, you know, we're asked to evaluate uh, each tendon specifically. You no, know? and just to show you, so 
Um, you know, here on this first video clip, the ultrasound probe is being placed at the MCP joint, uh, while the motion, the passive motion is occurring at the PIP joint, while the DIP joint is being uh, fixed uh, in one position. Here you can see that the, the motion is occurring at the PIP joint. And, um, you know, when you're looking at the uh, at these tendons at the level of the MCP joint, you can see that bo both of these tendons are moving, right, um, as you passively flex and extend at the level of the PIP joint. But now um, in the second video clip, you still have the ultrasound uh, probe at the same position at the level of the MCP joint, but now you're keeping the PIP joint in a fixed position and the passive motion is only occurring at the DIP joint. And when you do this, you know, you're really isolating the, uh, the motion of the, the FDP, the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, because the, uh, um, you know, the FDS tendons, the two slips of the FDS attach in the middle phalanx, and it's only the flexor digitorum profundus tendon that crosses the DIP joint. So when you do this maneuver, um, you, know, uh, you should only see motion at the FDP. And hopefully you can see the difference between the top uh, video clip and the bottom video clip. Here, you have, you know, both of these tendons are moving, um, but while here at the level of the MCP joint, this tendon is moving, uh, but this tendon that's forcing more superficial uh, is actually not moving at all. So this leads me to the first uh, audience uh, response uh, question. Uh, hopefully you guys were listening. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, what tendon is not moving in the bottom video. So I already said, really said the answer in, on the previous slide. Yeah, so you can see that, right? So this tend, so we're at the level of the MCP joint. And, and uh, as I sh showed from the previous slide, the, the motion is occurring at the DIP joint while the PIP joint uh, is remaining fixed. So when you just move the DIP joint, it's really, it's really the only the FDP that crosses that, uh, that DIP joint, while the FDS tendon uh, that attaches in the middle phalanx uh, is not moving. So the, the correct answer, as, uh, as most of you guys got correctly, is, is B, flexor digitorum superficialis tendon. Good. So um, I'll go through some cases, um, and hopefully these will be illustrative of uh, my, uh, my teaching points here. So the, the first case is a 35-year-old male with calf pain while exercising. And this is a, a pretty classic um, you know, uh, board, uh, board type question. Um, but um, just to show you, so this is the anterior aspect of the, uh, of the lower leg and you're seeing uh, the anterior muscles, it's specifically the tibialis anterior muscle. And all the muscles in the, in the lower leg are invested in uh, a, a superficial fascia called the crow fascia. And the crow fascia is being uh, pointed by the, these arrowheads. But if you look closely, um, as you follow the coral fascia, um, you know, you'll notice that, I mean, it's subtle, but there's this little defect here along the coral fascia, you know, uh, noted by the bracket. And when I play the cine clip, right, and uh, this is, so the, the, this is a typically a younger uh, patient, and the patient comes in with calf pain while exercising. So when uh, he contracts the muscle, uh, that's when he feels the pain. Uh, and he may or he may not feel a um, you know a palpable mass, um, but you can see that you know through that fascial defect, a portion of this muscle is herniating out. So uh, th this was an example of uh, the muscle herniation, specifically of the anterior tibialis. So this is um, as I already mentioned, this is a, a, due to a defect or weakening of the coral fascia, uh, and these patients. Uh, can present with either a palpable mass uh, and or uh, pain upon exertion. And that particular muscle, the anterior tibialis, which is one of the uh, extensors uh, of the ankle, uh, is the most common muscle in the lower extremity uh, to present with a herniation. Okay, um, this is a second case. So this is a 72-year-old female uh, with clicking of the shoulder. And um, I'll show you the, um, the, the MR, the, the uh, axial uh, in, intermediate weighted MR image of the shoulder just for reference, but we're really just, um, you know, imaging this area on this ultrasound, okay? Um, you know, and this is the ultrasound of the, of the same, same part of the shoulder. So you're seeing the subscapularis tendon here. This is the lesser tuberosity. This is the bicipital groove, and, and you're seeing the greater tuberosity of the, of the proximal humerus. And... Um, I'll, as I show in this cine clip, 
So now the, the patient is you know, externally rotating the shoulder, externally rotating uh, the, the proximal humerus. And at some point, uh, you know, you'll see this soft tissue that's snapping here. And that's the source of the, the clicking in this patient. So uh, the second question, uh, another audience response question is, what is the source of clicking in this case? So uh, yeah, more than half of you have said that it's the long head biceps tendon and a little less than half of you guys uh, think that it might be the subscapularis tendon. So this is actually the long head biceps tendon. So the subscap inserts like this over here in the lesser tuberosity, but this tendon is going back and forth and, and eventually um, the snapping re, uh, is due to this tendon going into the bicipital groove, right? So this is the tendon here. You know, um, and so the, the correct answer is the long head biceps tendon. Oops. Yeah, so, um, you know, dislocation of the long head biceps tendon can occur in uh, and out of the bicipital groove. Uh, and these are usually associated with tears of the subscapularis tendon. And um, unless it's fixed in, it's the tendon is fixed in dislocation. If it's a dynamic process where it's, you know, it stays um, with, in the anatomic location half the time and it only dislocates in it with certain movements, you know, you're not going to detect this on MRI. And, and but, um, you know, as long as the patient can reproduce the clicking sensation when the patient comes to you, uh, and this is something you should be able to diagnose on ultrasound. And um, so other sources of clicking in the shoulder uh, may include loose bodies, uh, labral tears have been described as a source of clicking in the shoulder, uh, even arthritis, uh, an arthritic joint, if there's bone on bone, uh, when the patient moves the shoulder, it can result in, result in um, you know, rubbing sensation and potentially clicking. You know? um, but um, you know, I, I haven't mentioned this earlier, but you know, uh, whenever these patients present with you know, any sort of clicking or snapping, um, you know, before we actually start scanning uh, using the ultrasound probe, I always like to examine the patient and I talk to the patient briefly and I make sure that the patient can reproduce uh, the clicking, you know, during the visit, because if it only happens intermittently and if he can't reproduce it during the visit, then there's no point in, in scanning the patient, you know. Um, and, and I palpate the area and, and have the patient reproduce the symptoms before I actually start scanning. You know, if you palpate and then you get a sense of, you know, what kind of structure it is. Is it a tubular structure or is it like a focal mass? You know, um, and how, how big or small is it? Is, is it something that's as small as a, you know, like a little, you know, uh, is it a pea sized thing or is it something that's the size of a, uh, you know, an orange, you know, so um, I, I think just feel a physical exam, uh, examining the patient and, and getting a sense of what you're dealing with is always helpful before you actually start scanning the patient. Okay, um, so this is a third case. Uh, this is a, a younger male with a painful snapping sensation uh, of the anterior aspect of the elbow. So, um, you know, this is the ultrasound. I'll play this click, uh, I'll play this video clip in a second, um, but we're really um, only looking at this area of the elbow. This is what, you know, the, the, the patient was feeling a snapping, um, you know, was able to reproduce it on, on cue, uh, just along this part of the elbow, along the anteromedial aspect of the elbow. You know? So the question is, what is, what is, what is, snapping. I mean, do you guys see something that looks like it's it's snapping back and forth? Oops. Um, sorry. But um, yep. I thought there was an audience response question. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so the diagnosis in this case is a snapping brachialis muscle. So you no, know, again, so this is the meat of the condyle uh, of the distal humerus. And that corresponds to this part. You can see that there's this piece of muscle that's snapping back and forth. And it just, I mean, you can't really see it like where it is, but it's, I mean, it's gonna be this little thing here. You know? So um, a snap, I mean, not just in the elbow, but in any part of the body, a snapping uh, a slip of muscle can be a source of clicking um, in any joint or any other body part. Um, for the elbow, uh, the snapping of this particular muscle, the brachialis, has been described uh, as a source of clicking uh, in the anterior aspect of the elbow. 
And again, this is not something that would be detectable on MR. First of all, it's 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 very small. No, um, it's, we're talking about just this area here. Just and for those of us that read, you know, these MRIs all the time, um, you know, we're not really focusing on something small like this. You know, this is, isn't really part of our, um, you know, our checklist when we're looking at this. So, so and so, if, if we notice some some subtle uh, variation in anatomy, we'll never be able to, you know, um, ident uh, identify it. Like if we're just looking at the MRI. No, and that's another good thing about ultrasound. Ultrasound, so you know, if the patient has a, a specific, you know, a, a fo focal area of clicking along just one part of the elbow, um, and the ultrasound is a very good you know, study for that because ultrasound, you know, you can really focus uh, your exam on ultrasound as opposed to somebody uh, who comes in with just like a generalized clicking and but can't really pinpoint it. They say that, oh, it's somewhere, you know, they fear clicking inside the elbow, but they can't tell whether it's anterior or, or posterior to the elbow. Um, on ultrasound, even, even using dynamic ultrasound would not be the best test for that because you know, um, ultrasound is, it tends to be a, a more focal, uh, focused exam. Um, so other sources of clicking in the elbow. So ulnar nerve is a very common um, source of clicking in the elbow. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you a case of that a little bit later. Um, but other structures like loose bodies can cause clicking. Um, uh, hypermobile joint capsules can also um, lead, lead to clicking as well. And, and just like anywhere else, uh, if the joint is very arthritic, just the, the bone on bone, uh, just rubbing of the bones together can cause clicking or, or uh, rubbing sensation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is actually uh, so this this pre previous patient with a, the slipping or snapping brachialis muscle, uh, just because it was symptomatic, this patient actually uh, went to surgery uh, soon after the ultrasound, and this, uh, there was a surgery. This was an intraoperative video that the surgeon was uh, nice enough to share with me, which kind of confirmed. You know, so that's the muscle slip that's snapping back and forth, you know, and that just is a, the the intraoperative core of what I was showing on the ultrasound. And they ended up releasing this portion of the muscle, and the patient, um, you know, felt much better. Okay. Um, next case. So uh, this is a case of an Achilles tear, uh, and you, you know, it's you. Uh, hopefully, you guys have uh, read, you know, um, ankle MRIs uh, of of this entity. It's a, it's a very common. Uh, tendon to tear, but this is what the um, Achilles tear looks like on MRI. Um, but ultrasound, you know, you can diagnose these uh, ruptures pretty confidently too on ultrasound. You can see the, uh, just the Achilles tendon on its side, and you can see that this big um, defect of the of the tendon. Uh, this is the distal distally at the calcaneal insertion. This is proximal near the muscle tendon junction. Um, but you can see this this full thickness tear of the Achilles tendon. But my next question is, um, this is another uh, audience response question, um, but uh, I'll show you two video clips of two different patients uh, with uh, Achilles pathology. And the question is, what's the difference between A and B? So the Achilles tendon is a plantar flexor uh, of the ankle. So if you wanna apply tension, you know, what you, so you have to uh, provide an opposite force. So, um, you know, uh, so if you want to apply tension to the Achilles tendon, you dorsiflex the ankle instead of instead of plantar flexing. You know? and um, you can see that uh, here. So this is the distal end, and this is the proximal end in this first video. And when you uh, apply tension to the to the Achilles tendon, you can see that you know this tendon, this part of the tendon is moving independently of this one, meaning that. Uh, you know, because there's a it's a complete tear, so there's no there aren't any bridging uh, tissue in between these two stumps. Now I'll tell you this is um, you know a, a, a different patient, um, but we're doing the same maneuvers, and um, you can see that these two are actually when uh, the ankle is being dorsiflexed, and you're applying tension to this part of the tendon. This part actually also moves too. Um, so this is actually not a um, no, I mean, maybe maybe it was an unfair question. So this is actually uh, this tear has uh, occurred at some time in the past. Uh, well, this is a tear in the acute phase. So um, you know, not all you know. You guys hear of uh, you know people getting um, repairs of Achilles tendons all the time, um, but 
Uh, even if it's a complete rupture, Achilles tendons don't necessarily have to be uh, operated on all the time. So depending upon the um, the patient expectations and the, the baseline level of activity and, and how close together the stumps are, uh, even if it's a full thickness tear, these can be treated uh, conservatively. So this is an example of a tear. It's a full thickness tear. Uh, it was treated conservatively, um, but we imaged it you know, uh, probably like a month or two later. And you can see that um, the, this is still a full thickness tear, um, but the reason this is moving, it's, it's already uh, started to heal. It's, it's, it, you know, a lot of it has healed. That's why it's moving in uh, this, the proximal stump is moving in concert with the distal stump. So the correct answer is actually C, acute versus uh, a healing tear. So it's not a, it's, um, they're both full thickness tears. Um, you know, it's not a partial thickness tear. Um, it's full thickness. Um, tear versus tenonosis. This is, uh, I mean, this is not just tendinosis, but this is an actual tear because you can see a, a defect through the tendon. And infective versus uncomplicated, nobody chose that. That's, you know, that's not the true answer, the, the, the correct answer. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I went through these points already. Um, so yeah, so when the tendon is undergoing healing, when some healing has occurred, you know, you're going to see some bridging tissue. And at that point, um, you know, uh, there is going to be some motion along the proximal stump uh, when the distal stump uh, is moving. Okay, um, next case. Uh, this is a uh, older female with symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. I'll say that this is intermittent carpal tunnel-like syndrome. Uh, and I'll just show you two ultrasounds in orthogonal images. So this is the first one of the, of the wrist in long axis. Scanning along the volar aspect of the wrist. And this is short axis. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what is going on? Um, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, a lot of you guys are participating in this, um, you know, making this a little bit more interactive. Um, so, um, the finding here is that, so you have the, the normal tendon there. So these are on the, the volar aspect of the wrist. So these are the flexor tendons, um, but, in between these, there's this encapsulated hyperchoic lesion that's going in and out of the field of view, and, and even here too. So these are the flexor tendons, and this is this hyperchoic mass. And so, so this has a uh, class, and it's it looks like it's encapsulated. I'm giving um, you know uh, important uh, clues, uh, but um, so it's an encapsulated mass, hyperchoic, and it has strands of uh, linear echoes in it. So this is uh, this appearance is a very classic for a lipoma, which um, uh, the major majority of you guys uh, guessed correctly. So this is a lipoma uh, that was moving in and out and going into the carpal tunnel intermittently as the patient uh, moved the, the wrist, and that was causing intermittent uh, carpal tunnel-like sy uh, symptoms. So this is not a, so, so it's. it's you know, the fun thing is this lesion here, and it's separate from the flexor tendon. So this is not a snapping flexor tendon. Um, you know, synovial sar sarcomas, like most sarcomas tend to have a hypoechoic uh, appearance rather than a hyperechoic appearance. Okay, and kinosynovitis uh, presents with, uh, on ultrasound, you'll see a lot of fluid around these uh, tendons, fluid within the tendon sheet, but you don't see any fluid here. So the correct answer is lipoma. Oops. Okay. Yeah. So this is the MR from the same patient. You can see that this is a uh, axial intermediate weighted sequence. So you can see that this thing is fat, uh, fatty in in signal intensity. And so any space occupying lesion, um, you know, most patients who, who present with carpal tunnel syndrome, they just have an enlarged median nerve and there's really no structural lesion that we can see, no, no soft tissue mass or anything like that. But if there were a uh, space occupying lesion, any, anything, whether it's a benign, uh, like a lipoma or something malignant uh, can potentially cause carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, this lesion was, you know, I thought it was a really neat case because it was causing dynamic compression of the median nerve, um, uh, which by moving into and out of the carpal tunnel, depending upon the, the position of the wrist.
Okay. Um, so the, uh, this next case, this is a 62-year-old uh, male with a snapping over the media elbow. So I've already showed you uh, one case of a uh, uh, something snapping in the elbow. This is another case. Uh, so this is so snapping is uh, this snapping um, in this patient is occurring over the medial side of the elbow, and this is a still image. I'll show you the video clip in a second. Um, but this is the medial. So this is anterior, uh, and this is posterior. This is the medial epicondyle, and this is a a structure that looks like uh, it's a honeycomb structure that has multiple areas of you know, hypoechoic bundles in it. Um, um, again, I'm giving you uh, important clues here. Let's just play this. Uh, let this play uh, a couple times. So again, the right side of the image is the anterior, and um, the left side of the image is posterior. So whenever uh, you know, I use the term radiologists, at least people who do ultrasound use the term um, honeycomb appearance, we're implying that it is a nerve. So um, this is the ulnar nerve, and you can see that it's snapping. Okay, uh, so um, um, ulnar nerve, uh, snapping ulnar nerve is very common uh, in the elbow. I actually both of my ulnar nerves snap, and um, but uh, you know I've been so far asymptomatic, um, but. Uh, in this patient, if you look carefully, there's something else that's snapping, that's moving with the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve is moving first, but then posterior to the ulnar nerve, there's this uh, muscular structure uh, that's also uh, dislocating anterior to the media epicondyle. So the ulnar nerve first, and then the muscle uh, is moving with it. So that's the medial head of the triceps um that's moving uh together with the ulnar nerve so the correct answer is d on the nerve and the triceps muscle so um ulnar nerve is a common source of snapping of the medial elbow um snapping over the medial epicondyle um but uh you know this this location of this nerve is very common and again uh, most patients are asymptomatic other than the fact that they feel something snapping there but uh, they usually uh don't present with um you know, symptoms of ulnar neuritis now if you have ulnar neuritis uh, at the elbow uh, the term is cubital tunnel syndrome you know um as opposed to carpal tunnel syndrome for the median nerve at the level of the wrist okay and um, the important thing to know is that you know, the surgeons would uh, send us these patients just to confirm that the patient has a snapping on the nerve. Um, but when you confirm that, you also want to make sure that there's nothing else snapping. Uh, for example, the medial head of the triceps. Uh, we've had cases where the, the surgeon assumed that it was the ulnar nerve that was snapping. So the treatment for this is transposition. So they would move the, um, the ulnar nerve anteriorly uh, so that it's no longer snapping. Um, but the patient, these patients, some of these patients uh, can can come come back without with, with persistent symptoms uh, if they also had a uh, hypermobile or dislocating triceps uh, that was not addressed during surgery. Good. So this is uh, this is the last case. Um, this is a, a younger male with a painful clicking sensation over the lateral ankle. Okay, so these are axial images uh, through the uh, ultrasound images over the lateral side of the elbow. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, lateral side of the ankle. This is the distal fibula, and you have the perineal tendons, the brevis and longus. And, and perineus brevis is going to be the tendon that's closer to the bone, right? So, so uh, B for brevis, B for bone. So that's what I uh, t teach my fellows. Just remind them that the if you see two tendons here, the one that's closer to the bone is going to be the perineus brevis. Um, and so, but this patient has a painful clicking. So what is going on? So you can see that the, the perineal tendons are moving, right? Um, so I think that the classic cause of um, the clicking over the lateral side of the, of the, of the ankle is is perineal tendon dislocation. So um, it's the superior perineal retinaculum that keeps the, these tendons in place along the perineal groove, you know, behind the distal fibula. Um, but if that retinaculum is torn or disrupted, and then the um, uh, one or both of these perineal tendons could dislocate 
anterolaterally relative to the distal fibula. But this is not, that's not what, what's going on in this case. Um, you know, neither one of these tendons are dislocating anterolateral to the, to the distal fibula. These are, both of these tendons are staying behind the fibula. But what's going on is these two tendons are kind of exchanging places. They're kind of, um, you know, uh, replacing each other in terms of position, and that's associated with a painful snap. So this is, um, you know, it's it's slightly different from just a classic anterior dislocation of the perineal tendon. This has been described as intrasheath subluxation of the perineal tendons. So, um, you know, uh, the again, the the, the classic um, condition is one or both of the these dislocating out of the perineal groove uh, and causing a painful clicking. Uh, but if these two cause, uh, they tend to if they switch positions, but they both of them stay behind the perineal groove or along the perineal groove, uh, that's called intrasheath subluxation. So this is something that, you know, the, the surgeon would want to know um, if uh, the surgeon is planning to, uh, uh, to operate uh, on these patients just to make sure, you know, just to know like exactly what is snapping, what is dislocating and what's, what's subluxating. All right, so um, hopefully I was able to, you know, um, show that uh, the ability to perform a dynamic evaluation makes ultrasound the ideal modality uh, for assessing musculoskeletal issues uh, involving clicking or something moving uh, that the patient feels. Um, and I've already mentioned this, but, um, you know, before placing the ultrasound probe in the patient, you know, I, th I think, you know, you want to have a, just a brief, a very brief conversation with the patient, uh, see what the patient is here for, and make sure that the patient could um, reproduce the clicking sensation, and and I try to palpate what what the patient is feeling, you know, and I think that just makes the exam um, a lot easier and more more reliable. And um, now again, like musculoskeletal ultrasound in general is um, is 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 pretty uh, challenging. Um, it's you know it's it's uh, it's different than MRIs uh, because on MRI all the images are provided for you you know so so um, you know if you don't know what the anatomy if you're not familiar with a particular anatomy uh, a lot of it you could look up in a textbook uh, but you can't really do that uh, you know when you're scanning somebody you know like you don't want to you don't want to like start opening up a textbook in front of the patient so so you really need to have a firm grasp of the anatomy um, you know uh, just in, in as in all musculoskeletal ultrasound um, but you know, and particularly in, in dynamic ultrasound. Thank you very much. Really excellent job, Dr. Endo, as expected. Um, I uh, have been keeping uh, track of the webinar chat and a lot of the uh, participants are saying, great job, thank you, great cases, thank you, amazing lecture, excellent lecture. I have a couple of questions for you, um, just a quick discussion, uh, a couple of discussion points. Um, but if any of the participants want to ask Dr. Anu any questions, we have a couple of minutes. So to go ahead and drop your questions into the webinar chat. Um, so Yoshimi, you said that, you know, when you're uh, uh, evaluating these cases, a lot of them are preoperative. So a lot of them are referred to us by surgeons who are wondering what to do surgically, whether to operate on these patients. So what are the conversations um, that you're having with these surgeons directly? I know you're all, you're putting a lot of pertinent positive and negatives in your report, um, but what are your conversations like? Uh, for example, you are you have a tendon evaluation um, and your surgeon is calling you and asking you to talk about um, tendon um, that you dynamically evaluated. What do you, what do you what are you talking about typically? Um, no, again, it really depends on the clinical scenario. Um, you know, but we. Um, you know, have a lot of interaction with um, the hand uh, and uh, upper extremity surgeons uh, that, uh, you know, that tend to operate on, on these patients. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I, a lot of the good surgeons know how to read MRIs themselves. So they typically don't ask us questions about MRIs, uh, you know, some may, but, you know, a, a lot of the good surgeons know how to read MRIs themselves, and sometimes better than radiologists, because they know exactly what they're looking for, um, and then what, what the issue of the patient is, um, but ultrasound is, uh, you know, that's not the case, you know, I, I think, uh, 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 at least at, uh, even in our hospital, you know, the, the, the orthopedic surgeons are, are you know, some of the best in the, in, the, in, the, in the country, if not the world, but even them, you know, they have, I think, difficulty looking at ultrasound themselves. So we can really provide a lot of uh, service 
um, by you know doing these exams. So you know, obviously, like you know, if 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 it's a, a um, like a tendon rupture case, uh, you know, they want to know like um, how you know how far apart the two, two tendon stumps are. Um, you know, because, it, uh, because if they're too far apart, that already knows um, you know, the, the surgeon already knows that, that, it, that that's like a chronic uh, scenario uh, and uh, the muscle have already like fibrosed or atrophied. And, and um, it means that you know, if, if the tendon stumps are far apart, um, it's probably more difficult to do a primary repair. In that case, they, um, you know, the, the surgeon uh, wants to know that ahead of time so that uh, you know, he's thinking that uh, you know, he's gonna have to put, put a tendon graft or a, a tendon, like a reconstruction, you know, rerouting tendons um, um, you know, in that scenario. And even if the tendon is like not torn, um, you know, they would ask us to do dynamic evaluation because, you know, um, it's, it's probably, you know, it's not something that we, we read about in the radiology literature, um, but among the hand surgeons, you know, when they open up these patients, there's like a lot of scar tissue along these tendons. And they oftentimes ask us, you know, is this, you know, how, how, how well is the tendon gliding? No, um, even if the tendon is not torn, you know, if there's a lot of scar tissue around the tendon, uh, the tendon may be scarred down, and, it, and it's 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 similar to like a stenosing tenosynovitis, uh, and 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 the surgeons will operate on it will, uh, on these on these cases. You know, they will try to um, you know take down the scar scar tissue uh, to to help uh, restore the gliding function of the tendon. So these are uh, things that. Um, you know, the, the the surgeon you know I I'll, they would ask me and and I would tell them over the phone or or you know um uh, on the re, on the report you know yeah. um they would also ask us like you know about about presence of um certain tendons so again like um you know a lot of these cases the 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 the, the surgeon needs to use a, a particular tendon for grafting purposes you know uh, like for example the palmaris longus uh, in the wrist uh, it's a common tendon that the, the, the surgeon would use. Um, also, uh, the the ex, the EIP tendon, the extens, extensor indices proprius tendon, is a common tendon that they use to for rerouting. So the surgeon would ask us, uh, you know, what is the status of these tendons? You know, does, does a patient have a pulmonary longus? Is, is, does it look robust that that um, the surgeon can use uh, as a graft? Is the EIP intact? You know, um, and, and so so these are the types of um, you know, the, the dialogue that we have uh, uh, between the radiologists and the surgeons. Thanks, Yoshimi. Um, yeah, no, in our practice, we have, as you mentioned, we have a lot of uh, uh, um, sort of very close um, interactions with our referring clinicians. Um, there's a question from the audience, and it, I think it's a pretty good one uh, for those who are thinking about incorporating musculoskeletal ultrasound in their practice. So somebody, somebody says, I'm a big proponent of musculoskeletal ultrasound. How do I convince others in my division that the time spent scanning and doing dynamics is worth it? Many just want to do MRI since it saves time, pays more, and has higher RVUs. So um, really good question in my, in, my, in my opinion. And it's a very relatable one because all of us as radiologists, um, all of those issues, time and re, uh, reimbursement, um, are really are critical to us as you know professionals and also just as human beings in general. Um, I can you know, Yoshimi, do you want to talk about? It? I I have a few thoughts too. Um, I you know I think it depends on the your private whether it's academic versus um, private practice. But you know um, the referrers are, are the ones that are ordering this test. You know so if you could um, if you develop a a good relationship with the referrers, like the or in our case, the orthopedic surgeons. And if you convince the orthopedic, if you just show the uh, the orthopedic surgeons, you know the um, you know what the benefits uh, of ultrasound are, or you know dynamic ultrasound over MRI. I mean, obviously, like MRI is going to be good for a lot of things, um, but there are definitely certain instances where ultrasound really um, you know makes a difference. You know, um, so if I think I think if you could get the referrers on board um, by you know, having th th those conversations, you know, just just following up with the surgeons, um, you know, and then it, giving them present ultrasound presentation, just to show show them the, what what you can do, you know, what kind of things you can do with ultrasound. And once you get the referrers on on board and they start ordering the ultrasounds, I think that's a good start, you know, because they're ultimately the one, you know, there there are our customers, right? Um, you know, so so if the if the surgeons start demanding the ultrasound, then that I think um, will. Uh, give you a lot of leverage. 
Um, Absolutely, Yoshimi. Yeah, it's really, um, you, you need to get buy-in from your referring clinicians, but first, there needs to be a champion in the mus in your in your radiology department for musculoskeletal ultrasound. Somebody who is willing to um, to build up the practice, and also tell the referring clinicians what ultrasound can do. Um, maybe somebody who can be a um, a consultant to the referring clinicians. Okay, in this scenario, I think MRI is better. Um, in this scenario, ultrasound can get give you a quick answer. It's really easy, um, and you don't have to wait for you know for uh, an MRI. Um, so having having those conversations with your with your referring clinicians can be really useful. It is Yoshima mentioned uh, also in his lecture that it's really important for you to um, know the uses, but also the limitations of ultrasound um, when it comes to diagnosing musculoskeletal um, uh, 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 conditions. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is great for specific questions. So is this tendon torn and where is the tendon um, where is the tendon stump? Is there a scarring around the tendon? Is this muscle herniating? Do you ha is there a um, uh, is the right is Achilles torn? Is this ligament torn? Um, if a patient comes in and you're saying they have generalized knee pain, um, please do musculoskeletal ultrasound. It's really not useful to the patient, um, and it's it time it's time poorly spent by the radiologist to do to try to sort of go, sort through all the structures in the knee. Um, if they say the patient has medial uh, knee pain, question MCL strain. Patient has had, re, uh, had a um, patella alta on x-ray, question integrity of patella tendon. Those are quick, um, easy uh, diagnosis to make using ultrasound. Um, they're always slam dunk. You know, you don't have to equivocate uh, on those diagnoses. So those are the scenarios that you need to tell your clinicians that you can um, you can uh, 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 diagnose using ultrasound, and those are the things that they should be referring to you. Um, in our practice, we do, Yoshimi and I give a lot of our clinicians a lot of lectures, grand rounds. And again, we're just hammering home the scenarios that uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound can, can be used in, um, in clinical practice. Um, uh, let's see, and we do a lot of MRIs in our hospital too. So I tell you right now that we're, we're, gonna, we, we're, we're, we're doing both. Um, just to, just uh, yeah, uh, another thing about uh, in response to that particular question is that you know um, I think you could also start by doing uh, a lot of uh, you know injections and arthrograms instead of using fluoride, you do it under ultrasound guidance. You know, I mean, I think that's a, that's a start. And if you want to if you want to just in start increasing your ultrasound volume up, I think the first thing could be just to you know do do all your arthrograms uh, using ultrasound as opposed to fluoro. Yeah, that's a great point. Out. I have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, um, somebody's asking, what maneuver do you use to check for perineal tendon clicking? So what are you, do you have a solution to dynamic, uh, dynamic checking uh, of the tear of anterior tibiofibrillar ligament? Um, so the first question was perineal tendons. What do you, what, what are you telling the patient to do to, 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 um, to recreate the clicking? Number two, um, how are you checking uh, anterior tibiofibrillar ligament? tear so um all of these patients if the patient is presenting with a clicking so you just ask them you know um like what motion uh reproduces the clicking you know that's so um because i think every ankle is a little bit different you know um so uh it's usually you know it's um like eversion and e, like eversion inversion maneuver uh that this talk is about but it really depends on the patient if the patient if the patient um can reproduce it uh in a, in a certain position and you know you just ask them to do that yeah sometimes you um the patients can easily reproduce it just by you know um uh, plantar or dorsiflexing their foot uh, everting sometimes they need a little bit of um they need some massive or um a resistance so i just have i put my hand on the transducer um, in the area of clicking, but then I put my other hand underneath their foot and have them push down on my on my foot. Um, you know, put the, like press on the on the on the gas, and that gives them the resistance that they, it needs to to um, to recreate the the snapping or 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 the pain. Same same is true for like a muscle herniation in in the leg. So a lot of times that requires weight bearing. Uh, so you can also you can have you can scan them. You know. With them standing up, you just kind of have to get down, <laughs> like low, and scan the leg. Um, or you can again have them just um, put uh, pressure on your, on some sort of resistance on your hand, 
um, uh, put the put, put the pedal down or or dorsiflex, and that typically will will um, recreate that that uh, herniation. Um, we're not doing a lot of tibiofibular ligament um, uh, evaluation, but I would imagine that it's similar, just weight bearing, sort of simulated weight bearing to look for gapping and then also looking for asymmetry, um, comparing the symptomatic side to the asymptomatic side, looking for thickening, gapping of the of the ligament, regional edema. What, what else, Yoshimi, anything else? Um, that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it, I think. But yeah, it's, it's important to, you know, if you're not sure about, you know, whether something is, you know, torn or not. I mean, you know, you have the, the good thing about ultrasound is that you always have the contralateral side for comparison. You know, it's much easier to do on the ultrasound than, than MRI. You know, so um, if you're not sure, like, um, you know, I, I constantly uh, tend to do that, you know, look, looking at the contralateral side just to, just to compare uh, if, if there's any question. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> somebody made a comment um, that how, how do you get ultrasound, radiologists to do ultrasound and is teach the ortho orthopedic residents to do it, and then suddenly the radiologists will be interested in doing it. Um, what? A little cynical. <laughs> Wait, what's the question? Sorry. Somebody just made a comment saying, you know, this is how you get radiologists to be interested in musculoskeletal ultrasound is teach another specialty to do it, and then all of a sudden radiologists will be interested in doing it themselves. A little cynicism for the evening. Um, okay, I'm my kind of person. All right. Um, I think we're we're ready to wrap up. Yoshimi, do you want to talk about the survey? Oh yeah. Um, so I think I think it's in in the either the chat or the email. But um, um, somebody from the SSR will be um, you know uh, sending you a survey to fill out. So please uh, um, you can spend uh, a few minutes just to fill that out to make these um, lectures uh, so that so that we could improve these lectures uh, for the next year. Thank you so much, Dr. Ender, for that excellent uh, lecture showing us how. Um, uh, well, musculoskeletal ultrasound is suited for sort of dynamic evaluation of musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal skeletal conditions. Thank you to the audience for for, for logging in and participating. Um, and next, the next uh, webinar will be on the 14th of June at 7 p.m. The topic will be approach to risk MRI presented by Dr. Dana Lim. So please tune in for that. Um, thanks again. I think this is this concludes our our webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for listening.